Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, once again in collaboration with my brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update over there in the United States of America. And we are going to do today the 80th part of the study Exploding the Israel Deception, where we have taken a little detour for the last uh, broadcast, because we are going to tell you um, many people who lived in the past, pre-Reformation times, during Reformation times and after Reformation times, and their view on the Antichrist, their view on who was beast number one and who was beast number two of Revelation 13, that is also part of the study, as you will see when we continue playing our little movie. And, um, you know, um, we did two parts uh, last time. Uh, we studied, and I have to take this picture because I don't remember by heart anymore. Um, we uh, studied the uh, Presbyterian Church in the year 2000 and their, um, their uh, resolution that they passed in the year 2000 on, this, uh, on their standpoint on the Roman Catholic Church. Um, we had the different quotes of wonderful reformers like... Um, Martin Luther, John Wycliffe, Arnold, Bishop of Orléans, Thomas Cranmer, and so on. Uh, you remember that we did that and what, what they said about the Antichrist. And now we are going into the third part and we are going into a few people of whom many names you have probably heard already, but also some names I'm quite sure that you have not heard yet who lived before reformational times, who lived during reformational times, and who lived after reformational times. And this is what most preachers during this era, uh, era taught regarding Antichrist. That's what we are going to have a look today, starting with Dante Alighieri in a moment, because now it is absolutely time, overdue actually, to introduce to you my brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Hello, Tom, and welcome to the Hello. podcast. Hello, Eric. It's a pleasure, blessing, and privilege to be here and uh, to be here with you and your listeners and uh, uh, our listeners. I stand to correct it again, but uh, uh, what, what I want to impress upon the listeners before we begin is that what we're presenting to you, what we have been presenting to you over the last several broadcasts, is irrefutable fact, historical fact. The Christians throughout history, all throughout the Christian era, were fully informed about who the Antichrist was. For for someone to say uh, that the papacy is not the Antichrist would be a laughing stock. Uh, for someone to say that the Antichrist won't be revealed until the end of time would be a laughing stock. And we're giving you irrefutable proof of the historical beliefs of Christians throughout the Christian era, they knew precisely who the Antichrist was. And, 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 and what this really boils down to is the question, why do not the churches tell us who the Antichrist is today? Why are they holding this information from us? Because this information was known from by, by Bible-believing Christians all throughout the Christian era. God's people have always known who the Antichrist is. And they were just as certain about it as they were that Jesus is the Christ. Now, you must ask yourself today, what is wrong with our churches today? Of all the generations of Christians from the first century to the present time, we are by far the most ignorant generation of Christians ever to be born into this world. And it's because, and listen carefully, it's because our pastors serve the Roman Catholic Church and not Christ. They serve the papacy the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. That's the only thing you can conclude by the evidence that we are presenting to you both today and previous broadcasts. 
our churches are teaching lies and they are intentionally withholding the truth from us. Why? So that we will all unite once again with the Roman Catholic Church and be one in the so-called Christian Church. That that they would there would be this unity that Jesus prayed for. Now look, did did Jesus pray for unity of God's people, the body of Christ, with Antichrist? That's a ridiculous assertion. But that's exactly what's taking place in the churches today. That's exactly why I tell people unequivocally, either take back your churches for Christ or get out. Now, before I go on too long, we're going to go through a list of names, many names that you've never heard before. Why? Because they keep the sec- they keep these names secret from you in the churches. They don't talk about these people. We're going to talk about them. We're going to give you the information that your churches are loath to tell you about. We're going to give you the names and the histories of the people who positively knew who the Antichrist was all throughout history people that should be our teachers today. And it's up to our pastors to pass on their knowledge to us, but they've hidden it from us. You have to know that there's an agenda behind that. And I've been preaching this for 20 years. It's high time that God's people begin to listen. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom, for your inaugural words to this, I think, very important broadcast and it is not so that uh, we are just going to play this little movie and go through the names and what these people's standpoint and preaching uh, was in the reference of most and for all Revelation 17 um, and Revelation 13 probably also and the interpretation thereof but as Tom said we are going to introduce these people too so every name that is here on the list uh, that is from before the Reformation and during the Reformation, I looked them up and I uh, got a link only from Wikipedia, I have to say. And Wikipedia is, of course, a page that is always to be taken with a grain of salt. The information in there or therein, uh, I should better say, the information therein is not always completely correct. The information therein is more or less provided by people who are not Christians, most and for all. And um, that's why you need to have multiple sources. But what I'm going to do is, when we are speaking uh, with the, the very first person we are going to address here, who was born about the year 1310, with the name of Dante Alighieri, as we are going into that Wikipedia page, have a look at him. And all these links of these people that I looked up will be provided for you in the description box of the video. So you can open these Wikipedia links up for yourself. You can read on your own speed because now you are bound to the speed how we are going to do this video. But you can read that for yourself in your own spare time and you can do your own research on these people and maybe get more information on these persons and also information that is maybe from other sources than just Wikipedia or just the quote-unquote mainstream and therefore maybe gives you some more detailed picture of Dante Alighieri or Michael of Cesena just to speak of the first two on the list here. Yeah? So these are the first two names that we are going to address today. Dante Alighieri. Now who was Dante Alighieri? I'm just going to click on the link Oops, he cannot open that. And why? Because I probably did a mistake here. Put something in there. There's the link. Dante Alighieri. And uh, Tom needs to read along. That's why I'm going to put this on uh, full screen. So I think that Tom has it now uh, a little bit easy to follow in the reading here. Right? You can see that, Tom? Yeah, sorry. I can see it. Yeah. yeah so we see Dante Alighieri um, was born... Uh, or lived between 1265 and 1321. So he was about uh, 50, some 56 years old or something that he got. Um, he, of course, is quite known for his work, um, The Divine Comedy, 
is something that he wrote and that name of course is when you are a bible believing christian kind of a blasphemy already he was a quote unquote supreme poet and um, it's not the idea that we go through all of this wikipedia i'm just scrolling down scrolling down that you see that he had a very uh, full life in these 56 years that he uh, walked on the earth before um, he died but the point is that you can look that up for yourself and you see there are many, many, many links in here that uh, will give you more information on everything. And here's a little overview. Uh, most of Dante's literary work was composed after his exile in 1301, so by the time that he was almost uh, 40 years old. The New Life is the only major work that predates. It is a collection of lyric poems with commentary and prose, ostensibly intended to be circulated in manuscript form, as was customary for such poems. It also contains or constructs the story of his love for Beatrice Portinari, who later served the ultimate symbol for salvation in the comedy, the divine comedy that is, a function already indicated in the final pages of the Vita Nuova that is new life. Eh? Vita Nuova means new life in, uh, I think, Italian that is, or, or Latin, I don't know, but it means new life. Uh, like here, the, the Vita Nuova, yeah, the new life, <laughs> you see. Uh, the work contains many of Dante's love poems in Tuscan, uh, Tuscany, that is a region in, in Italy, which was not unprecedented. The vernacular had been regularly used for lyrics works before, during all the 13th century. However, Dante's commentary on his own work is also in the vernacular, both in the Vita Nuova and Convivio, instead of the Latin that was almost universally used. Now, you have to know, this, uh, this makes Dante... A very in, uh, interesting person because he published his writings in the vernacular. That is the language of the John Doe on the street, to say. Yeah. Um, uh, there's another word that you have, uh, Tom, that you use for that, and I just can't come up with that. Uh, well, it, it, the, the Roman Catholic Church always called it the vulgar tongue. Vulgar. Thank you. That's the, the word that yes, I was looking yes. for. Yeah, the vulgar tongue. Um, that has nothing to do with being vul vul uh, vul uh, with vulgarity as we understand it today, but vulgar is just normal, plain. Yeah? Well, it has it's, everything it's... to do with how the Roman Catholic Church perceived the regular people. Yeah. But also a word oh. like that gets a different conno connotation <laughs> all through the centuries, Tom. Um, in... in, in uh, it, centuries ago it, it had that derogative meaning that it has today uh, it just meant it is uh, the people the, the language of the plain people yeah because the roman catholic hierarchy of course thought always of themselves as being something better than the plain people and, and that's why they probably chose that word the vulgar tongue the vulgar tongue is what uh, then later on in, in later times uh, the bible was uh, translated because it was only available in Latin and also many of these works that Dante here put in the uh, in, in, in the vulgar tongue were before only in Latin available as it says here instead of the Latin that was almost universally used yeah so we have in the time um, the use of Latin and most people didn't speak Latin didn't understand Latin it was the language of the educated and you were not educated when you were a farmer's boy or how do you say that in america a cowboy <laughs> yeah <laughs> then you did not have that so dante did something new he opened his work up to a new public let's say that's why Dante's uh, work sometimes is interesting to have a look on. Uh, this is here, of course, an illustration of For Purgatory from the Divine Comedy. This one, this is one of his most famous pictures. Uh, here we have another picture also from the Divine Comedy. Uh, uh, reminds me directly of uh, the Second Commandment. Thou shalt not make thyself any images of anything that is in heaven or on earth or in the waters beneath the earth huh? when you see all these quote-unquote angels or whatever they are supposed to be um, okay let's just leave it for this we are not going to do a <laughs> that big excursion into Dante Alighieri it's just to tell you a little bit about what he was what he did what his work was so he opened a lot of his work up to the uh, um, to the John Doe on the street yeah, to the normal person 
um, if he could read. And that also was a problem, of course, even in the Vulgar tongue. And he identified in Revelation 17 the harlot as the Roman church. And that is the point that we are actually talking about. That is the point that is actually interesting. By giving you a little bit background who Dante Alighieri was, was just to tell you that he was more or less a person who was educated through the Roman Catholic Church because in the times that he lived in the 14th century, and uh, there were there, there was no other education system but the system of the Roman Catholic Church. And being in the Roman Catholic Church with what he was to understand that the harlot of Revelation chapter 17 is the Roman Church is quite incredible, don't you think, Tom? Well, it would be incredible to anybody listening to this program who has gone to the Protestant and evangelical churches all their life and who have never once heard these things. Yes, this is Dante, baptized in the Roman Catholic Church, raised in a Roman Catholic country, uh, who obviously read the scriptures for himself and came to the unavoidable conclusion that Revelation chapter 17 speaks of none other than the Roman Catholic Church. So Dante, being a Roman Catholic, baptized in a Roman Catholic Church, living in a Roman Catholic country, surrounded by Roman Catholics, in a Roman Catholic family, concluded that the papacy is the Antichrist. Just as did all the Protestant reformers, who themselves were card-carrying Roman Catholics. Martin Luther was a card-carrying Augustinian monk of the Roman Catholic Church. Born, bred, raised, educated, promoted, paid by the Roman Catholic Church. And yet, he too, by the merciful grace of Almighty God, the unmerited favor of Almighty God, by the sovereign will of Almighty God, came to the unavoidable conclusion that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And he wasn't even a Protestant until he came to that recognition. He was a Roman Catholic. God's merciful, even to some Roman Catholics. And the evidence of that divine mercy is that they recognize the truth about what they call the only church on earth of Jesus Christ, the Roman Catholic Church, is nothing but the synagogue of Satan himself. Back to you, Yurt. So, Michael of Cesena is the next one that we are talking about. Michael of Cesena lived from 1270 to 1342, so from the end of the 13th until the middle of the 14th century. He was an Italian Franciscan. What is that? He was a member of the Franciscan Knight Order or Monk Order. Yeah? The Franciscans are a group of related mendicant Christian religious orders. A Christian, of course, you have to delete and write Catholic, primarily within the Roman Catholic Church. Founded in 1209 by quote unquote Saint Francis of Assisi. These orders include the Order of Friars Minor and so on and so on, and the Franciscans are on the basis of the Inquisition later on. So Michael of Cesena was a Franciscan, minister general of that order, and he was a quote-unquote theologian. That is someone who spends his life, should spend his life studying the Bible, but uh, they more probably studied the uh, dogmas and um, teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. His advocacy of evangelical poverty brought him into conflict with Pope John the Twenty Second. Now you have the whole biography. You have that he was summoned in Avignon, where you know that was the time of the schism. There were three popes, I think, and one was in Avignon at that time. That was about the 14th century. 
Uh, and in his later life, it says he continued to struggle for his understanding of evangelical poverty for the rest of his life and issued an appeal against uh, Antichrist Benedict XII, who had succeeded John XXII in 1338. He died in Munich in Germany and was buried there in the Franciscan convent in the Barfüßer Kirche, that is a barefoot church. He was officially rehab rehabilitated in 1359. That's what they do rehabilitate those people and then even make them saints in the Roman Catholic Church, people who they condemn first. Now, the interesting sentence is the last one. Michael of Cesena was one of the historical characters in Umberto Eco's novel, The Name of the Rose. You know that movie that was uh, made into a film with Sean Connery? Very, very famous movie that you have to watch a few times before you get understanding of it. So, this is about uh, the person that I've never heard of before, Michael Cesina. And he identified uh, the um, harlot in Revelation chapter 17 as the Roman Catholic Church. And also he said, the Pope is the Antichrist. Interesting, huh? Speaks for itself. This is, this is information that we should be receiving in our churches. Because our churches tell us that the Antichrist is not revealed in the world yet and won't be revealed till just before Jesus returns. Oh, with all but, my explanation, sorry, with all my explanation, I didn't switch on my mic. <laughs> I have to take this from the Skype uh, later on. Okay. okay, let's see, 21 minutes, I have to write that down. Yeah, sorry, Tom, continue, please. Yeah, so, so we're showing you what we promised to show you. That the saints throughout the uh, throughout the ages, even Roman Catholics, steep deeply in the Roman Catholic Church, destined for a Christless eternity, they came to the unavoidable conclusion that that's spoken of in Revelation chapter 17, the whore that rides the scarlet-colored beast, that is the Roman Catholic Church, and the papacy is the Antichrist, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. These are Roman Catholics who came to the unavoidable conclusions that all Bible-believing Christians throughout the ages came to. And that's why they were killed. They knew the truth. They spoke the truth. They could not be silenced about the truth. Look, if you know you live in a world that claims to be Christian, that doesn't know who the Antichrist is? How can you be silent? You can't. And so they were loud in their proclamation against the papal Antichrist. They were public in their opinions. They didn't want any soul to be lost by the papal deception, who called himself the vicar of Christ, the holy man of God in the world. They didn't dare allow this to fall silent. The warning went out loud and long and incessant, and to the point where the papacy literally had to order the kings of the earth to silence the dissent within their countries. And that's where the martyrs of Jesus came from. You should know all of these things. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Just seeing that I don't forget to switch on the mic again. <laughs> I dreamt that would happen and it happened. Okay. Johannes de Rip, uh, Rupes Kissa. Uh, some names are a little bit different, even uh, difficult even for me to uh, pronounce and you see here the name is in French Jean de Roc Teilhard. That's easier for me to <laughs> to speak out. Jean de Roc Teilhard, also known as John of Rupercissa, lived round about between 1310 and 1366-1370, was a French Franciscan alchemist. So we don't even have to go much farther into his uh, um, into his bio because we know that he lived, uh, in, uh, he died in Avignon, that is in the south of France, 
uh, also the, t uh, the place where the Huguenots lived. Uh, you see that he studied philosophy five years in Toulouse. And he uh, entered a Franciscan monastery at Aurillac, which is also there in the south of France. He was a Franciscan alchemist, so he had something in common with the, the guy we just spoke about before, the Cesena, uh, Cicesna, because uh, they were both uh, Franciscans. And you can, of course, avail yourself to uh, more information when you do your own studies uh, in this regard. Then we have the next one that is mentioned. Oh, by the way, what did, uh, what did Johannes de Repuchessa now say? <laughs> Not forgetting this. He says, uh, the Antichrist is the Pope. In Revelation chapter 17, Babylon is the Roman Church. And in Revelation chapter 17, the harlot is the Roman Catholic Church. And the Antichrist is the Pope. Okay. That is what you're seeing is dissent within the Roman Catholic Church. What you see is biblical Protestantism being visibly seen within the Roman Catholic Church. They will his, this, this is what is so important for the listeners to finally comprehend. These people were historicists in their interpretation of Bible prophecy. That Daniel's 70th week was fulfilled by Jesus, not in the future by some phony antichrist. The 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled in history by Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come. And just as the scripture declares, before Christ returns, that man of sin must be revealed. So they were actively watching and waiting for the man of sin to be revealed. Now, obviously, Roman Catholics are born and bred not to view the papacy as the Antichrist, but if they get their hands on the Bible, if they ever get their hands on a Bible and start reading, they can come to no other conclusion. But that the papacy is the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church is the whore of Revelation chapter 17, and many of them just plainly called her, you know, the synagogue of Satan. How would you feel waking up someday in the Roman Catholic Church being a Roman Catholic all your life, believing that it is the one church outside of which there is no salvation, and all of a sudden come to realize that it's the synagogue of Satan. Well, I got news for you. The same horror belongs to nearly everyone who's listening to my voice. Because every Protestant and evangelical church today believes that the papacy is not the Antichrist, never was the Antichrist, never will be the Antichrist, but he will be someone in the future who will come just before Christ returns. And he'll be a politician. He'll be, uh, you know, uh, an elderly statesman, and he will deceive the whole world in the generation of a lifetime. He will deceive the whole world, and he will cause the whole world to worship himself or an image of himself you've never heard a more cockamamie load of hooey in your entire life as what is church what is taught in all the protestant evangelical churches today they are totally apostate and this history that we're currently studying right here as you're listening is proof of that fact back to you your yeah, and it is also a fact that we are not the first who are studying this, but that has been studied all through the history. Now, the next person here is Francesco Petrarch. Let's have a look at who Francesco Petrarch is then. It says here, Francesco Petrarch was an Italian who lived between 1304 and 1374, commonly anglicized as Petrarch in his name, and he was a scholar and poet of early Renaissance Italy, and one of the earliest humanists. Now, Renaissance is a time period in the Middle Ages, they say, and actually means uh, be uh, born again, because naissance, uh, N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E, naissance is the French word for birth, and re means born again. Yeah. So, Renaissance, what was born again? Well, I'd say a little bit the spirit of man was born again that was uh, kept in the dark by the Roman Catholic Church for the centuries before that time. The Renaissance um, lauded in the time 
uh, end of the Dark Ages. Yeah? Petrarch's sonnets were admired and limited, uh, imitated throughout Europe during the Renaissance and became a model for lyrical, uh, lyrical poetry. He is also known for being the first to develop the concept of the Dark Ages, which most modern scholars now find misleading and inaccurate. Uh, the point is, the Dark Ages were the time of the time when the Bible, Bible was depressed by the Roman Catholic Church and the Renaissance started to bring in light into the world and especially the Reformation did when the Bible was then written and published in the vulgar tongue of the people so that they could read the Bible for themselves. Here we can read about his career and what he did. Uh, Mont Ventoux, that is in the south of France, a very nice region if you ever go there to visit. Um, here's his house near Padua where he retired and spent his last years. Some of his works are mentioned here. Uh, it's poetry, most and for all, that he did. Um, of course, he was uh, different from Dante's Commedia, but he probably was, uh, he knew Dante because they were living, they were uh, contemporaries, or how do you say that, when they lived at the same time? Yeah. Uh, and you have also work of him translated into, uh, into English. So you can have a look at this, and of course, uh, Petrarch was a devout Catholic, yeah? that's something you have to keep in mind. He was a devout Catholic and did not see a conflict between realizing humanity's potential and having religious faith. Now, that's uh, a oxymoron within the Roman Catholic Church because the Roman Catholic Church has, you have no quote-unquote human potential because you are under the yoke of Rome. Yeah? You have no mind of yourself, you have no free thinking, you have no free speech, uh, everything is taken away from you. That's Tridentine Roman Catholicism as we call it today, but that was before the Council of Trent, so uh, it was always the uh, most fundamental Roman Catholic way of thinking um, that there is no human potential to be developed and he said that uh, uh, he didn't see a conflict between realizing the, uh, man, uh, the potential of mankind, because I don't like to use the word humanity, and at the same time having a religious faith. Many philosophers and scholars have regarded Petrarch as a proto-protestant who challenged the Pope's dogmas. So you see, this is a very, very important person in history. And have you ever heard of him? He identified in Revelation chapter 17 the harlot as the papal court. Means the Pope and the Curia, as far as I understand that. Meaning the hierarchy, the top hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. He identified that in Revelation chapter 17. Now, the next one is uh, John Millich. Let's see. John Millich. That's this one. Uh, he was a Czech, like John Huss, okay? Uh, interesting is this picture here. Um, I had a look at that before. Uh, this is a brother converted to a convent. A brother converted to a convent. I mean, there are many books that Tom read, and I remember a few of them where he spoke about the brothels that were most of all in Rome. And even Martin Luther said that when he visited Rome, he said, if ever there was a hell, then Rome was built upon it. Huh? Those are the words of Martin Luther. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Rome in the time of the Middle Ages had more brothels than it had cloisters or uh, monasteries. Huh? A canvas uh, depicts a situation when former prostitutes from Prague quarter Venice are moved by military sermon to begin new life as nuns while on the place of former brothel is being built a cloister called um, New Jerusalem. Yeah? This is what we see here in the picture. So this is in Prague, the same city where Jan Hus came from, or Jan, Jan, Jan Hus, how do you call him? H-U-S-S, uh, -S, Hus, you English people may mostly say. Uh, Jan Hus or Jan, uh, John Hus. Uh, he also came from Prague. And Millich here converted a brothel into a convent. Now, 
neither Tom nor I say that a convent is something wishful to, to build up because it's not biblical, but it's much better to put these women from prostitution into a convent instead of living them, let them live in a uh, convert. Don't you agree, Tom? Well, yes, absolutely. And listen, I, I don't mean to be vulgar or crude or anything, but history leaves no room for doubt. No room for doubt. There's plenty and plenty of history, uh, recorded history, undeniable history, uh, that the nunneries in many Roman Catholic countries were simply brothels for the celibate priests. Okay, there I've said it. But but it's it's you you don't have to just count on me to tell you the truth. It's it's extant history. All you got to do is look it up. Uh, uh, the papacy uh, imposes upon the priest this cockamamie celibacy, where the Bible says, you know, where the the bishop should be the the husband of one wife. Marriage is is holy in the in the in the true Christian church, but in the counterfeit Christian church. Marriage is an abomination, and the priests are to be celibate. That is, they're not allowed to marry. But their human uh, necessities don't aren't suspended. They're still men, and uh, the papacy knows that. And so wherever you find a, a large installation of Roman Catholic priests, uh, you'll find prostitutes. You'll find houses of ill repute all over the place. And uh, that is age old. That's as old as the Roman Catholic Church itself. Roman Catholics know about it. It's no secret to them. And it's not even a shame to them. And uh, uh, wherever you find Roman Catholicism, you'll find prostitution. You'll find, you'll find uh, whorehouses. And the clientele are the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, many of the nunneries were simply... Uh, houses of ill repute for the priests. And there have been volumes and libraries of books written about all of the illegitimate children that were born to priests and their prostitute nuns in the nunneries and also the pits, the lime pits, where they, dis where they, where they discarded the bodies of the babies so they'd never be found and to hide the stink. They covered them with lime. It's found in Mexico. It's found in France. It's found in Portugal. It's found in Italy. It's found everywhere Roman Catholicism exists. Ireland, These, too. Yes. And and I'm not making this up. Yerk's not making this up. You no. can read it for yourself if you care to take the time. I can, I can show to you because ju just today I got an uh, article from RTL that's... Um, uh, um, that's a, a private television uh, channel in, in Germany. And this is an article about it. It's about a horror home in Ireland. Nuns threw thousands of babies away like garbage. This is the article. I'm not going into that because I don't want all these cookies and all that stuff. He sent me that article just today. You can see it here on Skype. Yeah. This is my brother, Marius. Uh, who has a Polish background, and he did uh, send me this today in 18 at 18:11. Ah, here, vandaag. That means today in Flemish. Today at uh, 11 minutes past six. And I told him, yeah, I already reported about this when I did the German uh, spoken series about the uh, Roman Catholic abuse of, uh, of of children, the systematic abuse of children. I called it there. But interesting that the same day that we are talking about this now, he sent me that link. And um, Tom, I know, uh, did read a few books uh, where that is off. And of course, the, the, the point that I want to make here when I say, well, Millich had a, a quote unquote wonderful idea to put that brothel into a nunnery, and that would probably be better, because he, I think he was not aware of this, otherwise, he would not have done that. He thought that he was probably saving these women. Yeah? But interesting is when you read in this article here, he was conspicuous for his apostolic poverty and soon roused in the enmity of medicant friars. The success of his labors made itself apparent in the way in which he transformed the ill-famed Venice Street in Prague Old Town quarter into a benevolent institution, the quote-unquote New Jerusalem. As he viewed the evils inside and outside the church in the light of scripture, 
the conviction grew in his mind that the abomination of desolation was now seen in the temple of God, and that Antichrist had come. And in 1367 he went to Rome, where Pope Urban V was expected from Avignon to expound these views. He affixed to the gate of St. Peter's a placard announcing his sermon, but before he could deliver it, he was thrown into prison by the Inquisition. There you go. That's what happens to those who know who the Antichrist is. They are thrown into the Inquisition. Their blood soaks the earth and still cries to the to God in heaven, just like the righteous blood of Abel calls for justice to this very day. That's what I call interesting information information for just reading the name John Millich, but now to understand that he identified Antichrist with the papacy, he identified the abomination of desolation with the papacy, and he identified the man of sin with the papacy. And that is remarkable for a man who had been educated in the Roman Catholic Church, but then oh, came he out. Oh, he was a slave. He was a slave to the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, but he lived in, in the Prague, and he had, the right. he had the possibility to see all the abominations in the town where he lived in, and then, being made familiar with the scripture, he compared scripture to what he saw in the world. What does the and scripture said, say? You shall know them by their fruit. Is that yeah, correct? exactly. And that didn't leave any other conclusion but the papacy being the Antichrist, being the abomination of desolation, and being the man of sin, or the son of perdition, as he is also called in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And I, I just think it's wonderful that we have today the possibility to speak about this John Millich, a, a, a man who probably none of our readers or very few of our readers or listeners ever had heard of, and to tell them that he went even out to Rome and affixed to the gate of St. Peter's a placard, means a plate, announcing his sermon against Rome, but he was thrown into the Inquisition before he could ever do that. Yeah, 1379, John Wycliffe. I think John Wycliffe is um, probably the most known of all the people that we speak about here, together with Jan Hus, uh, Jan Hus, or yeah, how do you say that? Uh, Jan Hus was greatly influenced by the work of, uh, of Wycliffe. And his followers were called the Lollards, who went through many, many years uh, proclaiming the true gospel of Christ all through the world. Um, Wycliffe's later followers derogatorily called the Lollards by their orthodox contemporaries in the 15th and 16th century adopted many of the beliefs attributed to Wycliffe, such as theological virtues, predestination, iconoclasm, and the notion of Caesaropapism. <laughs> what is that, Caesaropapism? There's a word for you. That is yeah. that the Pope is Caesar. Uh, right. you, you remember the picture that I always show of uh, Hour of the Truth uh, 30? Let's just look it up for once again. Uh, let's see, Hut 30. Caesar that from the Discorsi, you? From the Discorsi of Pope Pius, Pope Pius the IX. <laughs> huh? yep. you know? All hail King Caesar. There's your papal antichrist right there. He calls himself Caesar. The Go Caesar, ahead, you the can Caesar, tell it better than anybody. The Caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone obedience and fidelity are due. Huh? So that is Caesaro papism. What does that mean? That means what we spoke about in the last broadcast. The prayer of the saints in the first centuries who prayed for the longevity of the Caesars not to turn into papists, because Caesar or papism is just that. It is just the pagan emperor Caesar turning into the Pope. The pagan Roman Empire morphing into the papal Roman Empire. What do they both have in common? They are both Roman. They are both part of the last and four beast, fourth beast that Daniel described so eloquently in Daniel chapter 7. 
while questioning the veneration of the saints. Well, he must be an absolute heretic to the Roman Catholic Church, eh? He questioned the veneration of the sacraments, requiem masses, transubstantiation, meaning the making Jesus of a piece of bread and a glass of wine or a cup of wine. Yeah? That with the five magical Latin words, hoc est corpus enum meum, the priest creates Jesus Christ in the quote-unquote Jesus cookie. And you have to believe that you are actually eating the flesh and bones and sinews and muscles of Jesus Christ himself, the pure flesh. Monasticism and the legitimacy of the papacy, like the Valdensians, Hussites, the followers of John Hus, and Friends of God, the Lollard movement, is sometimes regarded as a precursor to the Protestant Reformation, though the movement was unknown to Martin Luther until after its commencement. Wycliffe was accordingly characterized the evening star of scholasticism and as the morning star, or uh, of course in Latin, Stella Matutina, of the English Reformation. The morning star of the Reformation. An epithet, uh, epit, epithet sorry, an epithet first accorded to the theologian in the 16th century historian and controversial John Bale in his Illustrium Maioris Britanniae Scriptorum. John Bale is another one who we are going to meet during the uh, watching of this list. Uh, he is, give me a second, John Bale, I knew I, I saw him. He's probably during the Reformation then, a little bit later here, going on. Um, I know I had him. <laughs> you, Latimer, Thomas Cranmer. John Bale, here, 1550. <laughs> now it's interesting. Now, now, now let's do a little research work here. Yeah? Wycliffe's writings in Latin greatly influenced philosophy and teaching of Czech reformer Jan Hus, whose execution in 1415 sparked a revolt. Yeah, that is the Fenstersturz von Prague, where uh, someone thrown out of the uh, of the window in Prague there, and the revolt led to the Hussite War. So, um, an epithet first accorded to the theologian of the 16th century historian controversy John Bale in his work. John Bale was an English churchman, let's just go right there, this is also Wikipedia, was an English churchman, historian and controversialist and bishop of Ossory in Ireland. He wrote the oldest new historical verse drama in English and developed and published a very extensive list of the works of British authors down to his own time, just as the monastic, monastic libraries were being dispersed. His unhappy disposition and habit of quarrelling earned him the uh, nickname Bilius Bale. Now, um, what do we have here? Summary of the writers of Britain, no, the image of both churches. The image of both churches uh, was published by John Bale in 1545 and is a detailed commentary on the book of Revelation. Interesting, huh? maybe you should have a look at this for your own studies. The last book in the Christian Bible. Bale proceeded by taking short passages and following with a detailed paraphrase to explain the meaning and significance of such things as the opening of the seven seals, the first beast, the second beast with two horns, the blowing of the trumpets and the going forth of the horsemen. Of central concern was the correct identification of the Antichrist. This must be highlighted. Of central concern in John Bale's book, the image of both churches was the correct identification, the historical identification of not the, the futurist identification. Bale's central thesis is that the book of Revelation is a prophecy of how God's word and those who love it, the saints, would fare at the hands of men and the false church during the last age, meaning the time between the ascension of Jesus 
and the end of the world. Now, that's very interesting. Bale identified two types of churches. First, there was a false church, or Church of Antichrist, which persecutes those who do not bow to its dictates. He did not entirely limit his criticism to the Roman Church, but, typically for the Puritans, accused the young Church of England. And I agree! And Tom does too! Because right. that church turned overnight from Roman Catholicism to Protestantism? No, it did not. It just changed its label, changed its name, but it didn't change its doctrines and its beliefs and its teachings. By contrast, the true church loves and teaches God's word truly. He also speaks critically of the church of Muhammad, its tyranny over the people, the Turks, and persecution of the saints. This is John Bale. Interesting, huh? Now, what did John Bale see? He saw the Antichrist as the papacy, abomination of desolation, the papacy, the little horn, the papacy, the man of sin, the papacy, Revelation chapter 13, the first beast, he saw the papacy, Revelation 13, second beast, he saw the prelates, we are going to go into that some other time, uh, what the first and the second beast is, and there will be also a few other meanings here. Uh, in this list. He saw in Revelation 17 the harlot as the papacy, he saw in Revelation 17 Babylon as the papacy, and he saw in Revelation 17 the beast as the papacy. Now, do you know so what, what can we all conclude about Baal? He was a historicist. He knew who the Antichrist was. He knew who the Antichrist was of history. Not of the future. Futurism is an absolute idiotic concept and it's designed its whole purpose is to 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 blind the eyes of God's people about the true identity of the antichrist the antichrist has ruled and reigned all throughout the christian era it's the papacy and by now, listeners are beginning to comprehend just how important this teaching is and just how apostate their churches are. And not only are they apostate, but they've got a Roman Catholic agenda to reunite you, body and soul, to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. That's their agenda. And they're doing it all in the name of, quote unquote, Christian unity. And if that's not blasphemy, I don't know what else is. And look, we're going through this minute detail about all of these names. But look how many names there are on this list, and look what they all believe. Why were you never taught anything about these people? Did you ever have a clue that there were this many people in the history of the Christian faith that believed the papacy was the Antichrist? And I'm here to tell you, this is the brief, the most brief of all lists. If you want a little longer list of those who believe the papacy was the Antichrist, all you've got to do is read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And then, only then, do you have a real concept of just how apostate your church is. What, a, what an enemy of Christ your, pa your pastor is. What a papist your Protestant and evangelical pastor is. Look, some, someday you're going to learn to appreciate Tom Fress and Yurt Glissman because telling these truths comes at a tremendous price, a, a price that we both gladly pay in hope of a, of a better life when this one is over. We're doing the heavy lifting. We're doing that which your pastor is just too 
corrupt to do. Think about it. Back to you, York. Good point there, Tom. I think they are all good points we are making here today about these uh, saints, men of God, every single one of them that we spoke about so far, I think. Um, that was John Wycliffe, and uh, now we are going into the next one, and that is Matthias of Jano, Matthias of Janov, as he is called in English. Um, he was a 14th century Bohemian ecclesiastical writer and one of the most significant authors of the nascent Bohemian Reformation. Now, the same place where Jan Hus also came from. Huh? He was the son of Václav of Jano, a Bohemian knight, and began his studies at the University of Prague before leaving to complete them in Paris. He graduated nine years later. For this, he is known as the Magist uh, Magister Parisienis. Um, in 1381, he was appointed canon and confessor of Prague Cathedral, offices he would hold until his death. Between 1388 and 92, he wrote several essays, which were later collected and entitled Regulae Veteris et Novi Testamenti, means Principles of the Old and New Testaments. This work has never been published in its entirety, nor can it be, uh, be found completely in any one manuscript. Some parts were falsely taught to be the work of Jan Hus, or Jan Hus and published with his writings. Jano thought that the evils facing the church in his day were due to the contemporary papal schism, you know, where they had three popes, one in North Italy, one in Avignon in France, and one in Rome, the large number of papal exemptions and reservations, the excessive importance attached by some Christians to accidental external practices. He advocated the removal of saints and their relics from the churches because of the abuses he witnessed involving their veneration. He also took the view that it was all but necessary for the laity, means the common man, to receive communion every day. Well, what did the Roman Catholic Church teach about receiving communion every day? First of all, they don't call it communion, but they call it the in the transubstantiation, the Eucharist, and they forbade the people in the time to have the bread and the wine. They were only giving the bread because the wine could be spilled or the wine could be uh, could be a part in the beard of the drinker and a drop could be spilled. So a, a drop of quote-unquote Jesus' blood would be spilled over the floor and that would be a sacrilege that was not allowed. So the Roman Catholic Church did not do the quote-unquote communion, uh, as we call it, um, they did their own transubstantiational Eucharist uh, sacrament with they that. Call it the sacrament, they call it the sacrifice of the Mass. The sacrifice of the Mass, yeah. Th those were Absolute the words I was looking for. Thank you, Tom. And uh, they forbade the lay people to drink of the wine. Now, here we have this Matthias of Jano in the 14th century who says it is necessary for the laity to receive communion every day, meaning to be with Jesus Christ every day, because that's actually what it means, because Jesus Christ said that we should do that in remembrance of him, so that we remember him. So it was necessary for the laity to remember Jesus daily. That's what this should read to say. At the Synod of Prague in 1389, such encouragement of daily communion was prohibited and the veneration of images was defended. Jano retracted his views and swore repeatedly that he had unfailing loyalty towards the Catholic Church. Yeah, there was no other and he didn't dare start his own, I guess. Therefore, he was not punished. Still, because of his previous claims, there are some who considered him to be a forerunner of Jan Hus. Okay? of the wonderful Prague reformer, who we are going to know uh, to get to know later. And now we are reading what did he say. We are here at Matthias of Jano. He said, Antichrist is the hierarchy, speaking the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. 
abomination of desolation is the fallen church, that is the Roman Catholic Church. The man of sin is the present church. Revelation 13, the first beast, is the papacy. Revelation 17, the harlot, is the hierarchy of the church, means again um, the popes and the cardinals. And Revelation 17, Babylon, is the popes himself. So he did not have the quite same clear view as anybody else, but what he did have is he attested every of this understanding, Antichrist, abomination of desolation, man of sin, Revelation 13 and 17, to the Church of Rome in one way or another. Whether he calls it the papacy or the hierarchy or the fallen church, it doesn't matter to me today. He had an understanding, I tell you, that is much better than 90% of the people living today have anyway. This Matthias of Jano living in the Dark Ages in the 14th century. Okay. Now we're going to take someone to close our reading up today because this is R. Wimbledon. Um, he lived about 1389. He identified the abomination of desolation as the papacy, but the problem is I looked him up and I couldn't find anything about him. So the closest thing that I found about him was something that looked very interesting. Let's have a look. It's a book. And here it says Thomas Wimbledon. But when you read uh, on, it says um, that this is written by R. Wimbledon. You see here. So I don't know why they write here Thomas Wimbledon. Here they say R. Wimbledon. And that's the guy that we are looking up. He wrote a book that is called The Ancient Method of Preaching. As delivered in a sermon, no less godly than learned, preached at St. Paul's Cross in the reign of King Richard II in the year 18, uh, 1389 sorry, by R. Wimbledon, published from the original manuscripts, revised and corrected. This is a book that you can buy at bold.com for about 14 euros, 15 euros. Um, if it is busy, uh, if, if it is available, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't even check that. Um, that's the only thing that I found about him. I didn't find anything else about the author, so I thought it's interesting to just show you that he wrote a book, and this book is uh, something we found here. It's, for the moment, it is, as you see, uh, it is not uh, possible to be delivered, not available. Need leverbar means not available in Dutch. So. Yeah, that is about um, our Wimbledon. And I said, let's make him the last one. No, why? We still have a few minutes to go. Let's go until uh, we have everyone before the reformational time. The next one is John Purvey. Ever heard of him? John Purvey? Who is John Purvey? John Purvey lived between 1354 and 1414, was an English theologian, reformer and disciple of John Wycliffe. He was born around 1354 in Lathbury, Newport, Newport Paino, in the county of Buckinghamshire in England. He was a great scholar permitted to enter all priestly ranks within the Roman Catholic Church, remind you, on March 13, 1377 or 1378. It has been assumed by scholars that Purvey became acquainted with Wycliffe's ideas in Oxford. Yeah? Wycliffe was a professor teaching in Oxford. And around 1382, Purvey lived with Wycliffe at Lutterworth, Leicestershire, along with Nicholas of Hereford and John Aston, and became one of Wycliffe's disciples. As we go through this article a little bit to the end, um, we see, ultimately, Purvey was accused of preaching heresy. Now, what is heresy? Everything that is not teaching what the Roman Catholic Church allows you to teach. Everything that comes out of the Bible, everything that is truth, that is heresy. Archbishop Arundel investigated Purvey's teachings and found several counts of heresy, including the invalidity of wrongful excommunication uh, and ineffectuality of papal law. He was imprisoned in 1390. Nonetheless, he continued to write various works, including commentaries, sermons and treatises condemning the corruption of the Catholic Church. By 1401, he was brought before convocation and, unable to face death by burning, 
like that of William Sawtree, he recanted at St. Paul's Cross in London and returned to Orthodoxy. He confessed on 6th of March 1401 and revoked his heresies. Afterwards, Purvey was left alone, and by the end of 1401 he was inducted to the vicarage of West Hythe in Kent. But like other followers of Wycliffe, who had recanted, he was ill at ease at his betrayal. Betrayal of Jesus, that is, dear listener. In 1403 he resigned from his parish, and for the next 18 years he preached wherever he could. In 1407 Purvey was named as a participant in the Old Castle Rebellion in Derbyshire and Warwickshire. He was arrested by 12th January and was held at Newgate Prison in London. He died of natural causes on May 16th in 1414. So he revoked his heresies in the first place, but then again he uh, was ill at ease at his betrayal of Christ. So again, he taught what he taught before then. That is, that he taught that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. And how can we say that? Bear, yeah, how can we say that? Because in, in, here he says, the Antichrist is the Pope. The first beast of Revelation 13 is the papacy. The second beast of Revelation 13 is the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. The 666 six, six number of the man, the man bearing that number, is the Pope. In Revelation 17, the harlot is the papacy. And in Revelation 17, Babylon is the papacy. That's what he said. That's what he recanted of. Then he got ill because of his recantation, and he recanted his recantation. <laughs> Let's say it like this. But please, Tom, you wanted to say something. I'm oh, I just, you. I just wanted to remind the listeners of a passage of scripture that describes this man. It says, "A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways." And we're doing this program so that no one listening to this program will any longer be double-minded. Firmly settled in the truth. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy, the historical papacy, is the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. And if you're sitting in a church today, you're being taught lies. Nothing but lies about the Antichrist. And you either you owe it to the Lord of glory to either take back that church so that the truth can be told or get out in Jesus' name. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. We still have to go to Walter Brut, who lived in 1393. And Walter Brut identified the Antichrist as the papacy the abomination of desolation as the Bishop of Rome, he identified Rome as the little horn, and he identified the papacy as the man of sin, Walter Brut. And I even made a little note that I said we should read what is in this little article of uh, Wikipedia. Just to show you, it's interesting, um, uh, I don't think that it's this one, but when you go to other languages, you often have much more information. Uh, sometimes in German you have much more information, sometimes in German you have less, and in English you have a lot more information. But what they write here about Walter Brut is, uh, do I uh, say that right, Walter Brut, the, the name? Tom, is that a correct uh, I'm not familiar experiment? with the man. Yeah, I'm not just, just the name Brut or Brat, what is it, because Brut normally is with, it, with an E in the end, I say Brut, so I just want to pronounce it correctly. Anyway, uh, Walter Brut was uh, his name in Welsh, was a 14th century writer from the Welsh borders whose trial in 1391 is a notable event in the history of Lollardy. So we're speaking of the Lollards, the followers of Wycliffe. Brut described himself as a sinner, a layman, a farmer and a Christian. In his trial for heresy, which took place on October 3rd, 1393, before the Bishop of Hereford, Thomas Threfnant, he is mentioned in the medieval English poem Pius Plowman. About the year 1402, he joined forces of Owain 
Glindwer. Difficult to uh, speak here. It seems then that this Walter Brute, by nation a Briton or Welshman, who was a layman and learned and brought up in the University of Oxford, yeah, where Wycliffe taught, being their graduate, was accused of saying, among sundry other things, that, quote, the Pope is Antichrist and a seducer of the people and utterly against the law and life of Christ, unquote. Being called to answer, he put in first he put in first certain more brief exhibits, then another declaration of the same matter after a more ample tractation, explaining and setting forth from Scripture, from Scripture, Holy Writ, the Bible, the grounds of his opinion. He is not stating his opinion; he is manifesting it by the Word of God. In either case, his defense was grounded very mainly on the Reformation, uh, on the Revelation. Sorry, for he at once bases his justification on the fact, as demonstrable, of the Pope answering alike to the chief of false Christs prophesied of by Christ, as to come in his name, of to the man of sin prophesied of by Saint Paul. The city of Paper Rome answering also similarly to the apocalyptic Babylon. Exactly what we read here. Antichrist is the papacy, Little Horn is Rome, and the man of sin is the papacy. Interesting, isn't it? I think for myself, for the moment, because I haven't read all this before, that going a little bit into the people is even more interesting than just reading their statements of belief of the book of Revelation chapters 13 and 17 and their view on the Antichrist. I think we are all learning here something today. Now the next one that we go into after Walter Brut is Jan Hus or Jan Hus. And there is not very much that needs to be said about John Huss. There is an interesting point that I want to make here for just a second, if you allow me. I'm going to my Hour of the Truth channel on uh, BitChute. And there you can see a movie here, John Huss, that is uh, on BitChute. I, I, cannot, I cannot upload this on, on YouTube. It's a movie about his life, uh, and it's about... Um, yeah, what is it? Uh, an hour or something long, huh? 54 minutes. Huh? Um, that's about Jan Haas. And I can only advise you to have a look at this. And uh, uh, the link of this movie is provided in the description box of the video. So we are not only going through here the Wikipedia. Uh, I'm also advising you to watch that f movie. And we went into John Huss, I think, on numerous times we mentioned him. He did teach in uh, Czech. That is the language they spoke there in Czechia, in Prague. Um, uh, he even had a little chapel there. It was called uh, Little Bethlehem, I think it was called. Uh, and from that he, he taught. And Jan Hus is, of course most famous, and um, that's why I'm not going through all this, you can read this for yourself, he was invited to come to the Council of Constance in 1415, and he was uh, promised a safe conduct. Uh, that's the way you pronounce it in English, right? A safe conduct, safe, a safe, safe trip. Safe passage. Yeah, safe, safe passage. passage. Yeah, to come to the Council of Constance. King Wenceslaus's brother, Sigismund of Hungary, who was king of the Romans, that is, of the Holy Roman Empire, though not then emperor, and heir to the Bohemian crown, was anxious to put an end to religious dissension within the Catholic Church, to put an end to the papal schism and to take up the long-desired reform of the Church, he arranged for a general council to convene on the 1st of November 1414 in Constance, that is in the south of Germany. 
The Council of Constance between 1414 and 1418 became the 16th ecumenical council recognized by the Catholic Church, thus willing to make an end of all dissensions agreed to go to Constance under Sigismund's promise of safe conduct. Yeah? <laughs> Just like I said. So he was promised a safe trip, even though that he was made out a heretic by Rome and they wanted to kill him. He was promised safe conduct to go there and defend his views. And what did they do? They betrayed him. They put him on trial and they burned him alive on the stake. For more information on that, I want to advise you, watch the movie that I just put up here uh, of John Huss in um, that on BitChute you can watch. You will learn a lot about that. It is not necessary to go into John Huss extensively here because uh, Tom did that in many earlier readings. I did that in many earlier readings. We both went into that during Romanism and the Reformation uh, and many other books that we read and explained. Um, it would be now a little bit uh, superfluous, I think is the correct word to say, to go into all that again. They uh, put on him a hat uh, as if that he was, uh, quote unquote, the Antichrist, and um, then, of course, burning him alive at the stake. Yeah? In 1415, that happened. So Rome uh, did not keep his promise. The emperor did not keep his promise, and the pope did not keep his promise. Pope Martin uh, issued a papal bull authorizing the execution of all supporters of Huss and Wycliffe yeah? later on. So the Inquisition really, really... Um, went into another gear at this time. Jon Hus identified the Pope as the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. He identified the abomination of desolation written of in the book of Daniel as the papacy. He identified the little horn that was um, also taught by uh, Daniel as Rome. He identified the man of sin as the papacy. He identified Revelation chapter 13, the first beast, as the papacy, and in Revelation chapter 17, the harlot and Babylon, both as the papacy. That is Jan Hus. And then we finally come to the last person pre-reformational times, Girolamo Savonarola. A very interesting man, I can tell you right away. Very strange look, of course, but he, of course, was Roman Catholic because there was no other church in that time where you could be of any significance. He lived between 1542 and 1492, sorry, and 1498. He was an Italian Dominican friar. So we already spoke of the Franciscans a little bit earlier. Now we are speaking of the Dominicans, and the Dominicans were the ones that handled the Inquisition in that time. They were absolutely, yeah, today we would say, or Tom would probably use the term, right-wing Roman Catholic to the core, Tridentine to the core, the Dominican friars. Yeah? In September 1494, when Charles VII of France invaded Italy and threatened France, such prophecies seemed um, on the verge of fulfillment. While Savonarola intervened with the French king, the Florentines expelled the ruling Medicis and, at the friars' urging, establishing a popular republic. Declaring that Florence would be the new Jerusalem, the world center of Christianity, and richer, more powerful, more glorious than ever, he instituted an extreme puritanical campaign, enlisting the active help of the Florentine youth. Now, what is more important is when we go into his later years. He was a preacher. He was a quote-unquote prophet. Savonarola preached the first epistle of John and the book of Revelation, drawing such large clouds that he eventually moved to the cathedral. Without mentioning names, he made pointed allusions to tyrants who usurped the freedom of the people and he excoriated their allies, the rich and powerful who neglected and exploited the poor. Complaining of the evil lives of a corrupt clergy, he now called for repentance and renewal before the arrival of a, divine, of a divine scourge. Scoffers dismissed him as an overexcited zealot and preacher of the desperate, 
and sneered at his growing band of followers as Piagnoni, weepers or wailers, an epithet they adopted. In 1492, the year that uh, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, Savonarola warned of the sword of the Lord over the earth quickly and soon and envisioned terrible tribulations to Rome. Around 1493, these sermons have not survived, he began to prophesy at a new, uh, that a new Cyrus was coming over the mountains to begin the renewal of the church. And so on and so on. Now, what does he have to do with any reforming? With Savonarola's advice and support, as a non-citizen and cleric he was ineligible to hold office, a Savonarola political party dubbed the Frateschi took shape and steered the friars' program through the councils. The oligarchs, most compromised by their service to the Medici, were barred from office. A new constitution enfranchised the artisan class, opened minor civic offices to selection by lot, and granted every citizen in good standing the right to a vote in a new parliament, the Consiglio Maggiore, or Great Council. So he is actually promoting something like democracy, which is of course an abomination to the Roman Catholic Church and to the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the Pope was not mollified. He summoned the friar to appear before him in Rome, and when Savonarola refused, pleading ill health and confessing that he was afraid of being attacked on the journey, Alexander banned him from further preaching. For some months Savonarola obeyed, but when he saw his influence slipping, he defied the Pope and resumed his sermons, which became more violent in tone. He not only attacked secret enemies at home, whom he rightly suspected of being in league with the paper curia, he condemned the conventional or tepid Christians who were slow to respond to his calls. He dramatized his moral campaign with special masses for the youth, processions, bonfires of the vanities and religious theater in San Marco. He and his close friends, the humanist Girolamo Benivieni, composed lords and other devotional songs for the carnival processions of 1496, 97 and 98, replacing the bawdy carnival songs of the era of Lorenzo de' Medici. These continued to be copied and performed after his death, along with the songs composed by Pia Giononi in his memory. A number of them have survived. Is he a proto-protestant? Well, Savonarola, like later reformers, desired a return to the early apostolic simplicity. The early apostolic simplicity. Return to the time of the apostles. Paul, most of all, who taught the Gentiles the Gospels. Many protestants view Savonarola as a precursor to the Reformation with respect to his views on the doctrine of justification, his emphasis on individual faith, his emphasis on the authority of scripture and compassion for the poor. The writings of Savonarola spread widely to Germany and Switzerland and due to Savonarola's life and death, many people started to see the papacy as corrupted and sought a new reform of the church. Many people saw him as a martyr, including Martin Luther, who was influenced by Savonarola's writings. Savonarola's beliefs on the doctrine of justification is similar in some respects to Martin Luther's teaching, stating that we are not justified by ourselves or works. Savonarola perhaps even influenced John Calvin, but this is a matter of historical debate. Savonarola never abandoned the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. For example, Savonarola held to a belief in seven sacraments and that the Church of Rome is the mother of all churches and the Pope is the, its head. However, his protests against papal corruption, reliance on the Bible as the main guide, link Savonarola with later Reformation. Savonarola himself held scripture as a very high authority. He himself stated, quote, I preach the regeneration of the church, taking the scriptures as my sole guide." 
unquote. It is untrue, he said, that God's grace is obtained by pre-existing works of merit as the works and deserts, uh, deserts were the cause of predestination. On the contrary, these are the result of predestination. Tell me, Peter, tell me, O Magdalene, wherefore are ye in paradise? Confess that not by your own merits have ye obtained salvation, but by the goodness of God. Just to end with a quote of this, he was excommunicated and he was put to the stake. And that, of course, is all something that you can read for yourself in your own study. And we will continue next time with the saints during the Reformation, telling you all about them, having a lot of links, having a lot of reason to discuss what we are watching here. And I want to leave now for Tom the final comment of this wonderful atheist broadcast that I was so much looking forward to do together with him. Please, Tom. Yes, now I'm going to blow the, not the minds of the listeners. These names that we've just gone through, these were famous names recorded in the annals of history who took direct opposition to the Roman Catholic Church, called it the synagogue of Satan, called it the Church of Babylon, called the papacy the Antichrist, on and on and on. These names come from the Roman Catholic Church itself. They were all Roman Catholics. But let me tell you, parallel with these people are a list of people innumerable who were never part of the Roman Catholic Church, who knew always that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan, that the papacy was the Antichrist. They were never Roman Catholics. This is the remnant of God. They worshiped in secret. They hid in the Alps. They hid in the mountains. They hid in the forest. They carried on their worship of Christ every day, but outside the wicked eyes of Rome. Can you comprehend? Can you comprehend how many there have been all throughout the ages who have known who the Antichrist is? You have to ask yourself, why are we so ignorant today? And what is the cause of this ignorance? You've heard me say it over and over and over again. The responsibility for this lies upon the breast of the pastors and the priesters of the Protestant and evangelical churches, wolves in sheep's clothing, traitors of Christ. They are ecumenical monsters hired by Rome to lead us all back to the Roman Catholic Church, keeping us ignorant of all these historical truths. And they're not to be trusted. They're not to be tolerated one more day. The answer is simple. We have to fire them. We have to remove them from their papal positions behind the pulpits of our churches. And either put true Bible-believing Protestants behind the pulpits or simply leave en masse from the churches and worship God in secret, underground, just like the saints of old throughout the Christian era. That's all I have for today here. Thanks. Bye.
suffering at the hands of Rome, cause they believe in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today.